Good morning and welcome everyone to the Opioid Use and Primary Care Conference 2024. Thank you for joining us today. I want to start the day with a land acknowledgement. CAMH is situated on lands that have been occupied by First Nations for millennia, lands rich in civilizations with knowledge of medicine, architecture, technology, and extensive trade routes throughout the Americas. In 1860, the site of CAMH appeared in the Colonial Record of Records Office of the British Crown as the council grounds of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, as they were known at the time. Today, Toronto is covered by the Toronto Perche Treaty No. 13 of 1805 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto is now home to a vast diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis who enriched this city. CAMH is committed to reconciliation. We will honour the land through programs and places that reflect and respect its heritage, we will embrace the healing traditions of the ancestors and weave them into our caring practices. We will create new relationships and partnerships with First Nations, Inuit and Métis and share the land and protect it for future generations. I encourage each of you to reflect on the land that you are currently situated on and to find out more about the Indigenous territories, languages and ways of life where you are situated. Just before we begin, a few um, housekeeping notes. I want to thank the Ministry of Health and specifically the Mental Health and Addiction Center of Excellence for support in making today possible and for their commitment over several decades to this event. First is the Methadone Prescribers Conference that was uh, hosted uh, through the CPSO over many years um, to uh, the CAMH. We know that education is one of the many pillars in addressing this ongoing crisis. This is our last year of funding. We want to express our gratitude for the opportunity over the years to bring together diverse groups of individuals involved in healthcare profession, policy, sorry, healthcare provision, policy creation, advocacy work, research, and with lived and living experience so that we can come together to share knowledge and have discussions across a breadth of topics related to opioid use. Before we begin the program, just a few more housekeeping items. If at any point in time um, you need tech support, there is a button um, down in the bottom left-hand corner that you can uh, click to contact um, the technical support. And I do want to thank the University of Toronto Conference Services for their support in um, providing um, us with the platform for the program today. Um, also, uh, through the platform during the breaks, um, there is a networking session. If you would like to um, chat with other conference attendees, we would also recommend that you complete your profile um, just so others can know a little bit more about you. And maybe um, I'd encourage you to start by um, adding an introduction uh, for yourself in the chat as well today. And then just a reminder um, of the code of conduct that we have posted on the homepage and our shared accountability for creating a space, safe space for discussion today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Monique Moller, one of our co-chairs for the conference. Dr. Moller is a staff physician and educator at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and an assistant professor in the Division of Mental Health and Addiction at the Department of Family and Community Medicine in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Along with her medical school in residency, Monique has completed training specific to addictions medicine and has a master's of science in, in pharmacology and toxicology. She's held many academic roles at CAMH and the University of Toronto. And at CAMH, she works in the uh, COMPASS program and as well, she's created the Addiction Consult Service and is courtesy staff with the new um, substance intervention team at the University Health Network. Dr. Muller is committed to education, research, and clinical initiatives in addiction medicine and with the overarching goals of improving access to treatment as well as outcomes. I'll hand it over to you, Monique. Thank you so much, Ashley. I think I'm getting some feedback. We may need to. Perfect. Oh, I'm still getting feedback. Hopefully, you guys aren't. Okay. So, Greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. Monique Muller, staff physician at the Center for Addiction Mental Health, as you heard. And it's my honor to extend a warm welcome to the Opioid Use and Crime Primary Care Conference. It's truly inspiring to witness such a gathering of dedicated individuals united in our mission to enhance our understanding and support for those grappling with opioid use and use disorder with empathy and expertise. Before we delve into today's program, I'd like to extend a heartfelt congratulations to the Conference Planning Committee, led by Sean Pattenode and myself, our other co-chair, Sean, who couldn't uh, unfortunately be with us today. 
Katie Upham, Jennifer Wyman, Victor Tang, and Nikki Bozanoff. Your creative and diligent efforts have brought us together today, and I want to particularly commend the committee for placing a spotlight on our Persons with Lived Experience panel, which we will commence very shortly. A special note of gratitude goes out to our exceptional education team at CAMH, including Asha, Galit, Caroline, Robin, our Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Education, Dr. Sanjeev Sokolingam, and our Chief of Addictions, Dr. Leslie Buckley, as well as countless others working tirelessly behind the scenes. Your guidance, mentorship, and unwavering support have been invaluable throughout this journey, so thank you so, so much. This year, our conference boasts an array of enriching educational streams, ranging from opioid use across a lifespan to innovative treatment strategies and support for our newest OAT prescribers. I extend my deepest appreciation to our all our esteemed speakers. And while I regret I cannot attend every session live, I'm eagerly anticipating revisiting them through the recordings, which will be available soon. And just a quick note of apology for having to cancel one of our sessions today by Dr. Alyssa Tedesco on opioid use and palliative care due to unforeseen circumstances. And so with a diverse array of perspectives, I'm also particularly eager to hear from our distinguished keynote speaker, May Katz, who joins us from Northern Ontario. May will share her insights as a primary care clinician providing opioid agonist treatment, offering invaluable perspectives from the front lines. Lastly, I want to express my gratitude to each of you for prioritizing this gathering amidst your busy schedules. Your presence and is pivotal in advancing our collective efforts toward evidence-based practices and fostering collaborative solutions for treatment and harm reduction. And so without further ado, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Katie Upham, who will guide us through our inaugural session called People Who Use Drugs, Diverse Perspectives. And just a note about Katie, Katie lives in Truro, Nova Scotia, and is a person with 16 years experience of injection opioid use. She's a self-employed as substance use health consultant and harm reduction educator, working with organizations such as Atlantic Node of the Canadian Research Initiative in Substance Matters and the Center on Drug Policy Evaluation. Furthermore, she represents Atlantic Canada on the board of directors of Moms Stop the Harm. Thank you so much, Katie, for being such an integral part of today's offerings. Now let's embark on this journey of shared and respectful learning about opioid use in primary care. Thank you all so much and we hope you enjoy the day. Katie? Thank you, Monique, um, for that introduction. So as mentioned, um, my name is Katie Upham. I use she, her pronouns. And it's important that I mention that I'm joining from Mi'kmaq, which are the stolen land of the Mi'kmaq people. We are very privileged today to be joined by a diverse panel of people who use, um, sorry, of people with opioid use experience, whose voices are often least represented in these conversations, and that experience intersecting stigmas as people who use drugs because of their race or identities. Um, so I'm joined today by panelists Ashley and John. Um, you can turn on your video if you like. Um, and we also have a third panelist, Millie, who will also be sharing their experience experiences in a couple of um, pre-recorded videos, as this was a more accessible form of participation for them. So they won't be live here today to answer any audience questions, but I do plan to save about 15 minutes at the end for the audience to direct questions to the panel. So please keep questions in mind as you hear from the panelists. So my first question is, is pretty simple. Ashley, I might start with you. Could you tell us a little about yourself? Sorry, I lost my button. Um, so my name is Ashley Smoke. Um, I come from a place called Alderville First Nations in Ontario. Um, and I started doing harm reduction work about 10 years ago, but I was, um, I guess you could say addicted to opiates. I would say dependent on opiates. Um, since I was 15, so the last like 18 years. Um, and through that time, I've been on and off of OAT, Suboxone, Safer Supply, all of the things. Um, and so I've really learned that it, for me, it's all about holistics, holistic healthcare, and that um, like meeting people where they're at and just like addressing all of their needs under 
the guise of primary care. So I think that's like what got me into this work and got me working with CAMH. Um, my pronouns are they, them. And yeah, I think that's good for now. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and lastly, we're going to um, turn to Millie for their um, video to tell us a bit about them. Hi, I'm Millie. My pronouns are they and them. I just wanted to say quickly thanks to the organizers of the event and the other people on the panel with me for giving me the accommodation of recording what I was going to say to answer the questions in advance. Um, that makes it much more accessible to me. And without that, I probably wouldn't have been able to take part. And because of my disability, that's why I'll also be looking at my notes and reading some things so that what I can say can make sense. And so I don't take up too much time as well and stay on track. Thank you. I'm an uninvited settler, born in Germany, living and working in Amiskwachi, Waskahigan, colonially known as Edmonton, within Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Region 4. I'd like to acknowledge that how much I empathize with the causes and effects I have experienced of being marginalized. This is one of the reasons why Indigenous causes are so important to me, as I'm grateful for the lessons that I've learned that I will never forget. I value the wisdom that has been shared with me by Indigenous peoples who shouldn't have needed to educate me, but still chose to anyways. So a little bit more about me. I'm autistic, ADHD, and I'm also transgender. I've also been using drugs for over two decades at this point, and um, I've used all, basically all kinds of drugs but my drug of choice eventually became opiates and opioids, specifically heroin and oxycodone. Uh, drugs became like essentially like medicine for me because of physical pain, but also mainly from ongoing complex psychological trauma related to being uh, for a long time undiagnosed autistic ADHD, also being transgender, so in a complicated world, not design me, where I'm often judged and uh, looked down upon and get marginalized just for who I am, how I was born. I've also been spent in over 10 years in various kinds of treatment for opioid use disorder. So on and off treatment, but tried pretty much everything there is to try. So like for OAT, tried methadone, suboxone, and uh, I've also um, had safer supply. So slow, slow release oral morphine, cadian, uh, oxycodone, and uh, tried fentanyl patches as well. And uh, yeah, quite a few years experience with some of those already. I've worked over the last few years in harm reduction at supervised consumption sites, uh, as well as Safer Supply Clinic. And I've been part of many focus groups, committees, consulting research projects. And I'm also just trying to do my best to be a disability self-advocate when I can, when I have the energy and when my health allows. Sorry about that, folks. I think we're having uh, some technical difficulties with the video. Um, I'm going to turn some questions back over um, to our live panelists now. What your experience has been like with caries, also known as take-home doses, of your opiate medication? Um, how is this supportive or unsupportive to your wellness journey? Say in Ontario, um, our clinics really feel like pill mills like they're very go in get your stuff and get out and if you ask for any antibiotics you're not getting it if you ask for um you know like primary care 
exactly like you you're not getting it even if you have no doctor so I think we really need to rethink the way that we do these things and these systems because nobody should have to come back eight days early from a funeral because of methadone a medication that like we all go to the pharmacy why should we have to go to a window and take our medication in front of somebody because we can't be trusted when in reality I trust more people who use drugs than I trust anyone else especially doctors and professionals so with that being said um my experience with carries and this also goes to like the um inequities within the programs I'm on safer supply with methadone as well so I don't have the con because I was kicked off of methadone um for taking Cadian so I'm not confined to the the punitive measures of a lot of clinics so I was actually emboldened and empowered with carries um and like first it was a week then it was two weeks eventually it was longer and that has actually like the carries the longer time I have carries like if say three weeks or four weeks or whatever the case is the longer I notice that I have carries the the more stable my life is so and that's not that it's not because I'm changing it's not because my use is any different it's because my life is more accessible to me and I can do the things I need to do without the stresses of having to go to the pharmacy so I think that was carries alone if I didn't have any other supports outside like wraparound supports outside of my prescribing carries alone would have improved my my life so I feel like criminalizing punishing people who use drugs because of they think they might not be able to trust them with carries it reinforces the stigma and it re-perpetuates stigma and it re-traumatizes us so we really need to be careful of how we approach carries and look at it from like a patient centered like point of view because three years ago my son overdosed on medications and three years later I am like very trustworthy and my son could never get into my medications so I think people change and that change needs to be recognized and reflected in the care you give. Thanks so much, Ashley. And I love that you brought up, um, yeah, those punitive measures. And when you think about it, um, the, to diagnose a, a substance use disorder in the DSM-5, one of the criteria is that you continue to use despite negative consequences. So I just, I like this idea, this, these punitive ideas, I think it might be a colonial idea, um, but it's, it's not working. We know that compassion and empathy and that trust freely given. Um, when my doctor trusts me, I, I want to be trustworthy, if that makes sense. I want to follow the rules and I want to, um, to show him those kind of positive changes for myself as well. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so my next question, I think this is one of the most important ones. Actually, I wondered if you could speak to the same thing about like acute pain care um, for a person um, who's indigenous and has a history of opiate use disorder and like those intersectionalities of those identities and how that affects your care. So in my, first of all, um, when I became addicted to opiates, um, can you hear my dog? I'll move.
I became addicted to like medication or dependent on medications. Um, basically by getting a prescription from a doctor who, oh my gosh. So yeah, from a doctor who basically was like, get out of my ER. I don't want to like deal with you. Um, and so it's kind of interesting because the doctor is like not wanting to give me care. I'm so sorry. The doctor is not wanting to give me care. But then when I go back to the ER, the same ER, like a year later for a back injury, they don't want to deal with it. And like 10 years later, I have a lot of issues with my back and like have to do physio and all these kinds of things. But I can't go to the hospital and get it addressed because they don't listen. I have a long-term foot injury that like I literally can't walk sometimes and it swells up. I went to doctors, hospitals, like I finally have an MRI like four or five years later. Like I, I think our pain is not even considered at all. And then you add being indigenous and then there's the connotations from like colonization with alcohol and like all of those past histories. So I think people look at indigenous people and see like that we don't need pain relief, I guess, because like even in the hospital when I was giving birth, I had to like argue for an epidural and because I argued for it, I was also almost refused it. And like, that's the ultimate pain. And if they didn't feel like I needed pain relief in birth, like, I think that just shows you where the, the racism is in the system, especially because after that, that was after they asked me why my last name was Smoke. Like, you should never ask somebody why their last name is what it is, especially a last name like that, because you don't know what kind of traumas come with that because we got this name from the Indian agent. So like, I don't know what our family's last name was. So like, there's so many different ways that like racism plays out in healthcare, in relationships with your practitioners. But also like my family had a lot of like fat shaming, like bad, like, cause we have, a few of us had like diabetes and I was 300 pounds at one point like and every time I was like feeling pain or sick or something it was oh you just need to lose weight you just need to lose weight and it, it's like no I obviously like that wasn't the issue but um yeah so I think there's so many like different ways that race plays into your care but when you add opiates to that I think it's exacerbated and then you are stigmatized and then that stigma makes it so that you don't go to methadone anymore you don't go to the hospital when you need to and I've had literally had people that I love die because they don't go to the hospital with an infection because they're either know they won't get the proper care and be turned away or they're scared that CAS will get called on them because they have kids they have to take care of. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Ashley, for being brave enough to share all of that. I really appreciate learning more about your experiences. Um, so uh, I'm gonna turn now to a video from Millie, but I wanted to preface it saying that Millie decided to spend the time they had during the session today on the issue of ableism and how this can create barriers for people who are neurodivergent, um, specifically within opiate use treatment and related services. And as someone who is also neurodivergent, I feel that this topic isn't um, discussed enough and voices like Millie's don't often get shared and, and make it into our public consciousness. So therefore we fully supported Millie in this. Um, 
So I just wanted to say that that this video response to the question will be longer than other responses today. So specifically, the question I asked Millie was, can you speak to how opiate use treatment is ableist in nature and how this can create barriers for people who are neurodivergent? So yeah, I've experienced and seen a lot of ableism when accessing treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, this is a lot in specialized, specialized clinics and, uh, you know, so places with harm reduction at the focus. So really it's like places that should know better, but it seems to be something that's just often forgot about. And I end up not being able to access clinics, access my medication, access appointments, um, end up un being un unable to access pharmacies to get my meds, um, or I'm just forced to because, uh, you, know, you know, what's worse consequences being sick because I don't have my meds or being, being sick and distressed because of what being in those spaces, like the physical uh, issues of the spaces and socially how I'm treated, um, you know, like I, I feel like I don't have much of a choice sometimes. So then I just have to go go in and, you know, it, it, it can cause, cause me shutdowns and meltdowns and sometimes even trauma, I'm already, you know, dealing with complex trauma most of the time. So um, I don't want to, a place where like I'm supposed to be, feel safe adding, adding to that trauma, right? So as I mentioned before, my, some of my diagnoses are autism and ADHD and uh, PTSD, among other things. So I have other physical and mental health conditions. And uh, for me, that, that makes me disabled. And these, these things inherently cause a lot of challenges, but there's a lot of parts of that. Like people talk about social model of disability where, you know, some of the things are within me, some of the things are things I can control control or minimize like to some degree, but really a lot of the issues they're having are, are stuff that are under control of the people working there, doctors, nurses, harm reduction workers, uh, social workers, like the people working in these spaces and designing and, and building these spaces as well. Uh, that could be minimized by offering accommodations that, uh, also learning to be empathetic towards me as what it is to be an autistic person. Like to me, that's not a bad thing. It's a, it's a misunderstood thing. And so some barriers of being neurodivergent and again, neurodivergent is uh, things like autism, ADHD, uh, dyslexia, and uh, there's other things that are under that umbrella. Uh, so, some of those barriers are being misunderstood and judged socially, kind of like I've talked about before. So basically not being liked and trusted for how I was born, essentially, right? Uh, there's this thing fairly new in psychology called the double empathy problem. I really encourage people watching this to go, um, to go look that up, the double empathy problem. And the basics there is that what they found is that, you know, it's thought that I'm like, like as an autistic person, the misconception is that we lack empathy, but that's not true at all. It like what it is, is that I have a harder time empathizing, uh, like they found autistic person generally, people generally have a harder time empathizing with non autistic people. And then non-autistic people have a harder time empathizing with autistic people, but autistic people empathize perfectly fine with other autistic people, like I do, I feel that. And of course, non-autistic people 
empathize really well with other non-autistic people. But you have to think of it like a cultural thing, you know, like somebody uh, from Finland or Japan, there's things I relate to there, like parts of their culture. Uh, like in Finland, people don't small talk as much. It's what I've learned. So like avoid small talk. And so to me, that's like part of being autistic. So, um, so, so yeah, this is a cultural issue, but anyways, there's that, there's that misunderstanding and, and it's, and it's like our way is, is the wrong way. So this is something that people need to understand. It's like, I come to you, I'm in your world. I try to understand you and I just want you a little bit to come into my world and, and understand, understand me. Um, like at least meet me half halfway kind of thing. And some of these studies showed that non-autistic people judge autistic people as being unlikable and untrustworthy within seconds or minutes of uh, just, just seeing us, you know, without having even done anything. So like this innate sense. And so that's already like what I'm working against going in anywhere, right? Going into these services. And, you know, that's just one thing. Um, for me personally, like I deal with situational mutism. So even though I'm speaking now in situations with new people or high stress, which is often like a medical care situation, I have difficulty speaking. So that becomes an issue. So I speak like with an AAC device, text-to-speech. So people need to understand that. Uh, environmental, uh, I have special issues with certain kinds of noise, background noise, then I have trouble processing uh, speech. So that be an issue, like getting the medical information. Uh, I have an issue with bright lights, especially overhead lights. Uh, some autistic people can have, it's like all kinds of sensory issues. So with scents, smells, a big one is um, myself, and I think a lot of autistic people have difficulty speaking on the phone. So this is a huge barrier in medical care because it's always like, no, you need to call us on the phone. Even if I say I have a difficulty, if I say I have a disability, like a lot of the time it's just like, no, you're being difficult. You know, I've even been hung up on. People get exasperated. Like just for these simple things, like I'm just trying to ask if I can email a question or book an appointment with an online system. Um, some of my difficulties are understanding instructions if they're not clear and then executive functioning. So planning, prioritizing, remembering. So, um, yeah, I need help. So that causes difficulty with like appointments, when to have appointments, um, all this stuff we need for, for, uh, to get care in these kind of clinics. So. Some simple accommodations then can be like to be able to people to book appointments online, to be able to message online, uh, have the option for video and telehealth care, like as an option. You know, sometimes it feels more important and I want to come in, but it's great to have that option for days when I just can't go out of the house. And again, making sure instructions are clear, um, having different options for lighting, being able to dim lights, that kind of thing. Uh, being able to have quiet spaces if things are overwhelming. And then the social things, like I was saying that before, like not, uh, if I'm if I'm being direct or asking direct questions, it's just because I'm trying to understand what's going on and I'm not being rude. So like for people to understand and empathize with my side and not see me as rude and not shut me out and not treat me badly as a patient, you know, like they shouldn't be judging me that way anyways, but people are human and unfortunately they do. And I've experienced that a lot. Um, and, you know, not doing things like not demanding eye contact or judging people if they don't make eye contact or fidgeting and think like, don't, don't think that somebody is being evasive for those reasons. Like they might just be autistic or ADHD or those kind of things. So it's not just an issue of making accommodations either. It's an issue of cultural safety and, and cultural humility. 
So being autistic, I have my own distinct culture shared with other autistic and neurodivergent people. So a lot of the principles of cultural safety and humility that are being taught, like it's something you might've learned if you're watching this, a lot of people are taught uh, working in this field. And um, these same principles can be applied to autistic and other neurodivergent culture and the end goal being a neurodivergent affirming services. So please seek out training. It's becoming more and more available, um, like how to be, how to have neuroaffirming care basically and cultural safety and cultural humility for neurodivergent people, autistic people, that kind of thing. And the people working in opi opioid use care are generally good people with good intentions um, so they, this ableism I feel is coming from a place of ignorance and not malice. And that's why I'm wanting to be a part of this and share my experience today. This, the ableism is causing a lot of unnecessary harm to people with disabilities like myself and working and volunteering in this field for quite a few years now, have I said, um, often when planning meetings and projects and committees and research are happening. And people are talking about my marginalized minority groups accessing these specialized services. Um, I find like disability is not even mentioned. Like it's, it's, it's not even, it was forgot about completely. So please, like if you're having those kind of things, uh, um, that, that should be something you're talking about. And, the reason this is so important, of course, it's important to me. It's hugely affected me accessing care. Uh, but generally, like being autistic makes me more likely to have a substance use issue. ADHD, even much more so. And then there isn't enough research on this, but I imagine the combination then of autism and ADHD makes me that much more, even more likely to have uh, substance use disorder. And so therefore, and then in my experience, a lot of these clinics have a lot of autistic and ADHD and other neurodivergent patients. And um, yeah, so that then us being a core demographic uh, in this type of treatment makes it makes it extremely important to recognize this ableism and uh, try to work to, to stop it and uh, offers better, safer service because further trauma has been caused so unnecessarily to people like me who uh, are already there getting addictions treatment because of trauma. I can see a, a good and bad side to Thanks, um, Millie, even though you're not here. Um, <laughs> I personally learned a lot from that video. Um, I mentioned I have ADHD in the chat, but, um, um, and someone else also mentioned that overlap, um, you know, with um, autism spectrum disorder and, and those kind of neurodivergencies I can be um, hard to diagnose and there's that overlap. So I learned quite a bit about um, the various that Millie was facing. Um, and so I have one last question I want to direct to our panelists each before we get to audience questions. So keep those in mind, please. Um, I'm going to want to start with Ashley this time. Um, we had kind of a thought experiment. If opiate use disorder treatment were to shift more towards treatment in primary care rather than specialized clinics, like, like most treatment is, what would you envision that looking like? And how would that be beneficial to you or maybe harmful to you. So this is an interesting question because in my like opinion, like I sh it shouldn't be a separate thing. Like it should just be like going to the doctor and having a cold or like, you know, going to your doctor because you need 
insulin. So I think like that, that would help shift a lot of things like including stigma, access, but then we have the problem of like primary care physicians, like we don't have them. I know here, like on, well, on the res, we definitely don't have them. They come in once a week, maybe. And then in town here, like my mom took like a year or two years to get a doctor like in three towns over. So there's no primary care. So I think we need to, we, I think we need to start integrating these things so that there are more physicians for everyone and people who use drugs can be treated like everyone else because they are like everyone else. So I think that would just be beneficial. I think what might be harmful is the loss of like that stigma-free, non-judgmental attitude that my care practitioner has. And because of all of the quabbling over safer supply in the media and whatnot, um, my program is shutting down and I'm at risk of not having a primary care physician or safer supply. And I just got my kid back. So I think when we do start and start these squabbles we need to really think about who is affected and how they will be impacted and their families and their communities because if I go down a lot of people go down with me a lot of people like there's so many people I support that like so I think yeah we need to fix a lot of those things shift a lot of attitudes but like we can do it and we need to do it because like everyone needs doctors and people who use drugs need like proper care and access to health care when they need it and not just for their opioid use stuff because a lot of the times if you deal with all the other health problems and mental health problems the drug use kind of like alleviates a bit and like you don't think only of that so yeah thanks Ashley I think that like wraparound care that you're speaking to is so important it does affect our substance use so much because usually we're using substances because our other needs aren't being met or like the structural systems in place that structural stigma is just impacting us so much and it's um People think it's all an inside job, um, but I think it's a lot of the systems and supports need to change that are in place. And uh, even our capitalistic hustle culture, you know, um, no wonder people use drugs in this society. Like truckers, you know, use stimulants. They're having to drive like 18 hours a day. I think I'd rather them be on stimulants than fall asleep at the wheel, actually. <laughs> so I think uh, we need to think or, about... Or when the politicians are like arguing about these things and saying things that are really really harmful and lies and like we have to see that like those are the kind of feelings that made us use drugs so it's no wonder why kids want drugs mm -hmm. that's just how I see it but yeah that stigma and that um, misinformation that's out there and that when you read that stigma in media it does bring up old feelings of like and wanting to use and and all of that absolutely but i think we need to think about the fact that there's something that makes drug use rational for a lot of us in this society to cope with what we're dealing with can you speak you you touched on this earlier but i wondered if you could speak more to the access issues you've experienced um in trying to access the form of opiate um use disorder treatment that you would prefer so like in my situation personally i've been on like i've tried everything i've been on methadone cadian suboxone tried suboxone i wanted to go on sublocade i dilaudid all of it 
And for me, the most successful I've ever been was on methadone, cadian, and Dilaudid all together because I have a lot of pain issues and the Dilaudid deals with that where methadone and cadian just deal with the opioid like withdrawals. So when I was like when I lost my kid, I there was a lot of like pressure from doctors, counselors, workers to shift to Suboxone. And that nearly killed me. Like I was so, so, so sick. And it actually set me back. And by like about six months of my life, like I probably could have had six months of like more success now. But um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like there's so many, <clears throat> there's so many options, but they aren't the correct ones that we necessarily need all of us like some of us need fentanyl like I needed fentanyl I could have got off of opiates so much quicker if you just gave me fentanyl (laughs) so um, I feel like there's yeah a lot of different options and when we let our stigma and judgment impact the suggestions we give people and we don't listen to like their concerns and their like histories uh, we like do the whole like sector disservice I think thanks Ashley um I wanted to mention um I had seen a a Twitter post recently from a doctor online and she said that if she refused to prescribe certain treatments for cancer for example because of her feelings or morals she would be fired um and so no offense (laughs) like um prescribers in the room um but I, i thought that 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 was really poignant you know and then kind of summed it up um i did have access to safer supply last year um and it i opened my own business last year while injecting all day every day i had the most successful you know year on paper um but I couldn't stop injecting and that did concern me. And so I I came off of it, but I had access and I'm in the same province as, as John, because through my work, I had direct contact information for safer supply doctors. And that really speaks to that inequity. Like I felt very privileged and guilty because I also felt there's people that needed it way more than me. And it was uh, very conflicting. For me because um, I believe um, that program can only serve, they have 93 people on the program, so that's for all of Nova Scotia. Um, Okay, I wondered if we might um, switch and talk a little bit about the drug poisoning crisis that we're in currently um, and how it's kind of become the norm. We know that BC declared it a public health emergency, I want to say back in 2016, Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was 2016. I wondered what it was like um, sort of working in the crisis, how it affects you personally, um, your friends, your family, the people you serve, and what's needed to change the crisis. Ashley? So I, during COVID, lost every single person that I knew growing up that used drugs like everyone I lost every friend every like client there was actually a time when our clients were all gone like every outreach client so and and that program is flourishing more than it ever has now so like that just goes to show you it's not getting better it's getting worse but it's like doing all this like advocacy and like outreach work like doing like my job it's been actually like really traumatic because you see all of this happening around you And you can't really do anything. So, yeah. And, like, I think we lost 
members of like organizing like or like drug user organizing groups during covid like a few of our board members and stuff like passed away so like it really took a toll on me but it also like invigorated me a bit at the same time because all of those people like I have to fight for now and it's so it's like a lot it means more to me I think this work now having been through all of that but I think to change this we need to stop blaming the interventions that we created because we were asked to um and like we need to stop blaming like safe supply and harm reduction and safe consumption sites and decrim like those are not the issues the issues are actually the people that are like having the most issues with those things are actually the ones who harm us and like are the ones who harmed us to use drugs a lot of the times so I think we really have to stop blaming interventions and things that are actually helping people and we need to focus on how we can collaborate as a community and collectively advocate to the government and to like policymakers like about the, the things that need to change and like I think it's also like we have to think we have to reframe everything this is not working. This will never work the way that it's going. We have to rethink the whole model and we have to think of it like we think of HIV care. We can't we can't have people just stop being drugs without replacing education, housing, social environments, activities, self-care like why is it that we promote those things and those things are part of HIV care and support and they're funded, but those things are not funded for people who use drugs and treatment. Also, the whole treatment model needs to change. Like the rehab, like institutions need to be, like you need to know that when you go to one rehab, it's the same as the other rehab. And like, maybe not the same, like maybe a bit of a cultural difference, but you need to know that the standards are the same and that you can expect the same treatment, the same um, care and like non-judgment. So, yeah. Thanks, Ashley. And I think we need to think about how those treatment um, centers are, a lot of them are privately funded. So if their motivation is profit, they really don't want to fix anyone. Like they would want you to start using again so you can come back and get more treatment. And I don't know that we have solid evidence that some of these long-term treatment programs work. Um, Not that we shouldn't have them if people want them, but we need to make sure they're safe for people. They don't re-traumatize people. They have cultural safety and and humility, indigenous ways of practicing um, care and and harm reduction. Thank you both so much for sharing your experience, your wisdom, your expertise, your traumas with us. That's huge to share that kind of experience in hopes that we can learn from it and do better next time. So I just feel really honored to have you both here. And and thank you, audience, for your thoughtful um, um, responses in the chat there. Yeah. I can see a, a good and bad side to OUD care um, in in primary care rather than specialized clinics. Like uh, I, I've experienced both. Um, I, I would like I I think more options are always great. You know, like I want, I want to see more of both. Like the the benefits to having it available in primary care. Hopefully, like if there's a lot of primary care physicians offering this service then hopefully that would mean that people could go to a clinic that's closer to them, uh, making it more accessible, go to a place 
where it's not so overwhelming, like maybe a place where they feel safer. Um, maybe if it's a doctor that they've already had for a while, it's like somebody that knows them well, so can hopefully give them better treatment. And, uh, you know, hopefully for, I've always lived in cities really, but for people living rural and remote areas, you know, I could see that giving people more options, not having to travel as far as well. And the other side of it in, in specialized places, like, even though, like I was saying before, like a lot of the accessibility stuff and ableism needs to be worked on, but um, there at least is this built in a lot, a lot more knowledge about like why I've have, have trauma, you know, trauma informed care and um, being just less judgmental not, or non judgmental in the first place about using drugs and uh, being understanding about the ups and downs and treatments or not showing up for appointments and what and the barriers and what can get in the way. So so that part can be really good about specialized care or places that uh, are a bigger service and can connect you more easily to other services. You know, that really helps. And places that can have a lot of people on staff, hopefully, that have lived experience, that kind of thing. But yeah, really, hopefully, it can be in both, like have both available, like just more of it everywhere, more, better. So if somebody feels safer and like it would be better to go to the private, primary care physician, uh, then they have that option. And if going to a specialized clinic, they find it would be better. They have that option to like just, just being a people being able to choose uh, that that's what I want. And, you know, I wouldn't have to sign an agreement like that. I could just pick it up like another medication. There'd be just the regular narcotics restrictions. But, um, but I've literally had that at the same pharmacy where if I'm coming in for opioid use disorder, like I'm in the same person at the same pharmacy, but if it's for OUD, I have to stand at a different window, and then if other people are there, like I think a lot of people know if they're re regularly picking up prescriptions that if you're standing over there, you know, you're the person getting methadone or other things. Like they're like, stand over there, not with the, the other people coming in. So that feels like a different, like you're a different class of person. You're being singled out, kind of uh, having to sign these kind of agreements that are very strict um, about when you're gonna be picking up, if you're gonna be late, if there's gonna be consequences, um, like how you behave when you show up, if you're intoxicated, that kind of thing. And then, yeah, so after surgeries, just been able to go to the regular window, pick up the medications, and, and it's also just, uh, you know, how am I treated? Like, so at the pharmacy, I've had, you know, some of the pharmacists be nice, but at some, some pharmacies, I'm just treated like I'm a shitty subhuman person, like somebody who can just treat bad before I've even done anything, you know? Like they're already being short with me and impatient before I've even said anything, you know? like. Like they don't want to deal with me or, or I've had where the people serving me, like they don't even want to really look at me. I get that, I get that feeling. And then I, I've come in after the surgery and stuff and it was all friendly and fine. Just like, just like it would be for anybody else, you know, and I've had these surgeries while also on the, uh, getting the addictions treatment. So yeah, it just seems especially, especially strange then the comparison. And uh, yeah, and the different treatments too, like when I was going for surgery, 
but I had the opioid use disorder uh, prescriptions. Uh, you know, I had OAT, I think, once when I was doing surgery, and I had Safer Supply, and I'd known for the surgeon for a while, and when I had first met my surgeon for the first surgery, I was during a time where I didn't need any treatment at that time. And then later on, like a few years, I'd going through a really rough time. And then uh, I, was, I was back, had prescriptions again. And it, was, and it was really helping and everything. But yeah, when I had to list all the medications before the surgery, then I, I could just tell this, my surgeon's mood just really shifted, you know, and I just felt like, like I'd done something wrong or disappointed them or something. So, you know, that kind of thing feels bad. And then, and then the different rules they having while, uh, while I'm going to clinics and that kind of thing, of course, like having to do P tests and that kind of thing, invas semi-invasive, kind of embarrassing, things like that. Um, you know, it doesn't feel fair when other people are not having to do those things who are just uh, uh, getting a prescription for pain management, that kind of thing. So yeah, those are the differences I've experienced.